All right, guys, why don't we get started and people start to trickle in. It's right after, right after 4 o'clock. Thank you for joining us for another one of NASKY's interesting case webinars. Uh, the, this is going to be October session. I have a few cases prepared. And you guys, as you know, feel free to uh, reach out and let me know if you have any cases you want to share with us, any questions. Build, you know, this is a conversation. We're here amongst friends. And this is very, very informal. So why don't we get started? Uh, and you know what? If you don't mind going to the chat box and putting in where you're from um, and, you know, what what are you doing at your organization or so, some sort of brief intro, that'd be cool. So we start to getting, getting to know each other a little bit better. All right. Let me see. Uh, here we go. Let's play this. All right. Uh, Perfect. All right. So this is a uh, curious cases again. Uh, usually we just kind of scroll through them together. I, I had time to put them a little bit more organized and get you some more information on some cases and let's see and get through them. And again, feel free to unmute yourselves and talk to us. Uh, no financial disclosures. And we're going to, of course, talk about some uh, use of gal gadolinium for cardiac imaging, which is off label. Uh, case one. So we have a 21-year-old female with no significant past medical history, uh, comes for evaluation of bilateral lower extremity edema, some distension, some other non-specific signs that you can see there. Uh, this is a patient from the islands in the Caribbean. Remember, we're, I, I'm located in um, Southeast Florida, so we get a fair number of patients from the Caribbean. It's a patient from Nassau, came in with shortness of breath, this all this swelling, abdominal distension, as, um, and accordingly, to the reports from the hospital in Nassau, she had a cardiac tamponade uh, described on echo, and she underwent pericardiosynthesis, and there were some inflammatory cells noted. She ha has a hepatomegaly, some elevations of the enzymes, etc., and there you can see some negative testing. Um, so again, just to summarize what we talked, uh, couldn't keep any PO intake, um, some weight loss in the past month, um, and diarrhea as well, some new information that we, we were able to gather. Then again, very non-specific findings, no fevers, and then shortness of breath that gets better when she sits up. So there's some clues here and there as we mo move on. There you see the result from the echo in the Bahamas, the, the effusions, both pericardial, and um, uh, there were some uh, plural effusions, uh, was placed on Lasix. And again, this is a very young woman, so no real history here. This is a chest x-ray on admission. So we see there's uh, some um, enlargement of the cardiac silhouette. And this is the echo performed when she arrived. So you can see, I don't think you guys, oh, there you, you can see my, my cursor hopefully. So you see there's some fluid some pericardial fluid still here, posterior and anterior to the heart. Uh, the motion, not great. So maybe some degree of tamponade there. Uh, four chamber view, again, transthoracic echo. And you can see there's a small to moderate pericardial effusion. And not a, not a great uh, contractility to the heart. CT of the chest with contrast that performed uh, at our institution. Here you see there's again this effusion, bilateral plural effusions and pericardial effusions on this very young woman. And when we look uh, a little bit further down in the abdomen, we see all of that refluxing of very dense contrast into the IVC and the hepatic veins, which talks about increased pressures uh, in the atria, so some reflux into the IVC. And some of the same in the coronal plane. Now we're looking at a MRI. This is a bright blood uh, sequence, and if SSSP, uh, steady state free procession in the two chamber view. And again, we demonstrate that there's that per color diffusion and some decreased contractility to the heart, some limited relaxation as well. Uh, if you look at the mitral annulus, 
uh, you should do a double take. That's a normal diastolic function. Uh, the second bump of it really trying to reflect the atrial contraction to complete the feeling of the left ventricle, and we don't really see that. So there's some diastolic dysfunction here. Four chamber view kind of demonstrates similar findings. This is probably one of the most interesting uh, sequences in this patient. So it's a perfusion exam. Anybody wants to make a comment on this? All right. So we see uh, normal perfusion of the myocardium, but what's very interesting here is look at the pericardium. You see that there is pretty avid, um, almost immediate enhancement of that pericardium. So that there's something going on there. That's just not inflammatory. It's it, it, it there's there's more there's a lot of vascularity going into that per thickened pericardium. And it's, uh, it's kind of subtle if you're really not looking for it. Some tagging in the short axis. Again, what you're trying to see on tagging when you look for pericardial disease is that those uh, those lines, those uh, lines of signal void, when the heart moves, like right here, where the fat in the retrosternal fat and the pericardial fat and that kind of... It, moves apart from each other that there should be breaks the fact that the lines just distort you can see them they don't break apart from each other that tells you that the structures are not moving freely against each other rather they are kind of adhesive and that's why we don't see those normal looking breaks um, and that's pretty much across the entire circumference uh, of the pericardium where it touches adjacent structures and this is your late gadolinium enhancement images here. Uh, you can see there's persistent bright enhancement of that entire pericardium that looks very thick and doesn't look much like an effusion anymore. It really looks like it, everything was just very, very, very thickened pericardium. So any thoughts? Anybody wants to try and, and give us your thoughts on the case? All right. So patient went to the OR and they did a pericardiectomy. They took some pieces of the pericardium. This is uh, one of those pieces. And I can tell you uh, that it looks very, very thick, significantly thicker than normal pericardium. Um, my disclaimer here is that I'm not a pathologist, so I'm not even going to try to go through them. So we're just going to move quickly until we get to the very last one. Uh, we see a lot of nuclei, a lot of cells in there for sure, a lot of purple. And again, lots and lots and lots of nuclear and cells. And this is a specific stain, and it's called uh, calretinin. Um, this is used specifically for some uh, markers of disease. Um, this on a high magnification or high power, power and calretinin. It's a calcium binding protein, and in immunohistochemistry, it's a uh, can attach to both benign and malignant mesothelium and mesothelial cells, again, benign or malignant. And this is helpful sometimes to differentiate some lung tumors. So this case is a very, very rare case. It's a primary pericardial mesothelioma. Again, it's very rare, a horrible prognosis, uh, uniformly fatal, uh, in mean survival is less than a year. After diagnosis, the, you see there the incidence. Again, it's extremely rare to see them. And it represents just a very small number of the mesotheliomas that we can develop in our body. Um, it's the third most common primary malignant pericardial tumor after angiosarcoma and rhabdosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma. And again, I think that speaks of how rare primary pericardial tumors are altogether to have this one be the third most common. So it usually arises, or not, not usually, but it arises from the serous mesothelial cells lining body cavities. And we all know this is uh, most of them happening in the pleura. And then we probably have seen at some point during training or in our careers, uh, one in the abdomen coming from the peritoneum. Um, very rare in the pericardium and even more rare in the tunica vaginalis uh, than in the scrotum. Um, and then cell types are different subtypes of pericardial mesothelioma. 
happen more mostly in men with the median age at 46 years old and can present with heart failure, pericarditis, tamponade, or constriction. There's some risk factors. And again, can be localized, can infiltrate the myocardium and the other the structures in the heart and completely encase the heart like the case that we just saw. It's very difficult to diagnose. Like I think this case initially until the pathology was, until actually the surgeon went in, people were thinking this was gonna be just pericarditis, maybe even tuberculous pericarditis. Um, um, and again, like it says here in the, from the literature on a autopsy series of a lot of patients, most of them were made post-mortem. And to make things even more difficult, the pericardial fluid and the cytology is negative, like it was in this case when they did the first pericardiectomy, uh, I'm sorry, pericardiosynthesis back in, in the Bahamas. Does not respond well, so therefore that that poor prognosis. So, and that's what happened is with, with this patient, but patient passed. Okay, that's one case. Any questions or comments about that one? All right, very good. Let's do case number two. 38-year-old female with acute loss and issues, uh, neurological issues, um, right facial droop and dysarthria. So doesn't look like a normal case for a cardiac imaging meeting. And this is the echo. Any thoughts on the echo? Who wants to talk about the echo? All right, so we have a mass in the left atrium here, bouncing, seems to be attached up to the interatrial septum, um, and kind of bounces and moves towards the mitral valve plane. Again, all those, these are buzzwords for the most common intracardiac benign tumor uh, or neoplasm. That's not a thrombus, and that's gonna be your atrial myxoma. But the patient came for neurological issues. So here we have a CT and MRI, and you can see there's an area of hemorrhage in the right occipital lobe, some hypotenuation surrounding it as well, and then uh, some uh, enhancing nodular mass corresponding to that area uh, on the contrast-enhanced MRI. Oh, and by the way, the patient also had a history of a cardiac myxoma that had been removed in the past. So we're looking at a familial issue here uh, and this is what's called a metastatic atrial myxoma. So again, we talk about atrial myxomas as being benign, uh, but there are very rare cases that some of the cells can actually embolize and seed other organs, and they have been described uh, mostly in the brain. Uh, this specific patient went for resection, had uh, the, the pathology revealed that it was a metastatic myxoma, and then the patient came back a year later with new uh, onset of seizures, uh, and issues with her left upper extremity. So they repeated the exam. And you can see there in the right occipital region, there's resolution of that, uh, of that mass. There's a new area of subtle enhancement, a new mass if you look at the image on the right. So there's a new deposit of uh, what's considered to be an, a new lesion of metastatic myxoma to the brain. So again, these are the myxomas are friable tumors. Uh, usually arising in the interatrial septum near the fossa ovalis. Uh, that's at the pretty classic location. Uh, the diagnosis is based on how obstructive it can be uh, so that it leads to echocardiography or some other type of imaging. Um, again, most common primary cardiac benign lesion, uh, about 30 to 50% of them, relatively uh, common to see them. And there's symbolic events associated with it, usually of thrombi that happen between uh, the, the the tumor walls um, itself, but not necessarily as a metastatic tissue, like in this case. Metastatic uh, myxomas are gonna be very, very rare. Um, again, the presentation is as mass lesions as expected, and there's very few reports available, and they have been reported everywhere in the body. Uh, having said that, no transformation have, has been uh, seen in the setting of an embolic event. And interestingly, there's really no immunohistochemical staining between benign and malignant types uh, determined to, to, to understand better why some may actually uh, embolize and, and, and seed different tissues. 
Okay, so here we understand why they may become symptomatic. And this is a path from the from the image. And again, I'm not a pathologist, so uh, we're just going to assume that that looks like myxoma tissue. Uh, now, they can be familial, and it seems like that was the case here, as the son also had one, uh, commonly in the carny complex that we all studied for our boards uh, with multiple myxomas, uh, some pigmented nevi, and on endocrine overactivity. But there's a couple other syndromes, like name syndrome and lamb syndrome, uh, which also present with atrial myxomas as part of a familial disease. Well, that's interesting. The second author on that first reference is Dr. Fauci. I think it's a different one, though, than the ones on the news. Any questions about this case? Any comments? All right, very good. On to case number I think two. it's the same policy. Did you see where he's coming from? He is the editor of Harrison's. Yeah, he's one of the main editors of Harrison, correct. Right, so I bet you that's Anthony Fauci that we all know and love. Yes, there you go. Actually, you are. I, I just looked at the name. I didn't look at the rest of the reference. You're absolutely correct. All right, so Dr. Fauci, say, save us again. That's why he's the man of the year. Awesome. <laughs> All right, case three. Um, thank you for pointing to that. History. Another. Oh, young females are having a rough day today. 20-year-old female presenting with a history of toxic shock syndrome, uh, acute renal failure, multiple workup since extreme fatigue, and diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which we all know is difficult to, to diagnose, and sometimes it's just a, a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, she was seen by uh, an endocrinologist, and at least somebody at some point found that she was extremely ta uh, tachycardic, 106 to 110 beats per minute, and was sent to a cardiologist. Again, it's a very young female, 20-year-old. and they did an echo and found another mass. Anybody wants to describe what they're seeing? So this is a transthoracic. It's pretty similar to a three-chamber view. Uh, so parastenal longitudinal long axis. So here's the aortic outflow track, left atrium back here, left ventricle and this part of the right ventricle. And we see this hyperechoic mass involving the distal to apical wall, uh, posterior wall here of the left ventricle. So again, very, very hyperechoic and not a lot of shadowing behind it. Another view, similar view, and just kind of redemonstrates what we were describing earlier. For chamber, we well, it's just really just a single chamber. We mostly only see the left ventricle, and we see this mass here and how it kind of protrudes into the lumen. Uh, it's very interesting how um, obvious it looks on these images, and it's not as obvious on, or it doesn't look as prominent on the next modalities as you'll see. So this is a four chamber, steady state free procession MR sequence. And we see here again, towards the lateral aspect of the wall, there's some thickening here of this fat. It doesn't look as mass-like or bulging into the lumen as it did on the echo, but definitely there's something there is, there's some, some India ink artifact around part of it. This is a two chamber view. And again, we see that area by the apex uh, with low signal intensity. This is, I believe, a contrast-enhanced uh, sequence that we did, uh, probably a Vive in that plane. This is in the short axis. Again, here it looks again like it's really impinging that mass-like process into the ventricle, which is kind of different than what it looked on the four chamber. Black blood sequence. Um, with some fat saturation. It's not very homogeneous, but you can definitely see some fat saturation in the mediastinum. And you see there's some, some uh, signal drop of this mass. Actually, this is with real fat saturation, and you can see there's significant drop of the entirety of that mass. Perfusion. There is some perfusion to the mass.
and this is your late gadolinium enhancement and you see that striated uh, enhancement um, of that area of the myocardium patient also had a CT done after the MR to further characterize uh, because clearly it's not a very straightforward diagnosis and you can see there are very low signal attenuation looks like a very infiltrative uh, fatty uh, rich mass in the left uh, ventricular lateral wall towards the apex and on a two chamber reconstruction again this is a study without contrast you can see that same uh, hypoattenuating or fat attenuation infiltrative type lesion. This is with contrast. And again, there's you can see some uh, streaks of contrast, some wavy lines of contrast through the mass. And a four, four chamber reconstruction. So not, not a straight axle, but a four chamber reconstruction. Patient went for PET CT. There was a high concern for a liposarcoma. And there was absolutely no FTG uptake in the mass. All right, guys. Any thoughts? Any brave souls out there? So patient went to the OR to get some samplings. Again, because even with the negative PET, it was uh, very uh, concerning for a liposarcoma. And we see a lot of adipose tissue here. Mainly, we don't see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, cells, and not, not that many nuclei, but definitely a lot of adipose tissue here. High powder uh, power, same same thing, just a lot of adipocytes, and some fibrous uh, some fibrous tissue, some some fibro fatty replacement. And this is a path report: adipose tissue infiltration and interstitial fibrosis. And I'm not going to make you read everything. Mature adipocytes. But it, they, they had a very interesting comment, the pathologist. Um, imaging studies uh, in particular um, may also reveal adipose tissue infiltration in the right ventricle, suggestive of ARVD, ARVC. So again, uh, the pathologist was starting to get concerned that what he or she was seeing, that's that this infiltrative fibro fatty replacement could be focal ARVD or uh, dysplasia or cardiomyopathy uh, focalized in the left ventricle. So that was the diagnosis that was given to the patient. And the patient actually uh, has done well. Uh, her heart rate has been controlled with medication and has been seen now for several years with follow-up MRIs with absolutely no change in morphology, no change in size of the mass. Um, Patient um, has not received a AICD either or anything. Uh, she has been under control and, and doing well. Any questions about this case? Did she have uh, genetic testing, Jacobo? I don't remember. Um, I don't remember. This is a case from a few years ago, and I. Don't recall. No problem. Just, just I don't think so. I don't think so because I would have added that. Okay. That's a great question. All right, guys. I have two more cases, but it's uh, any of you have cases, we can jump to you guys, and then if we need to, you know, I can go over the other cases to to complete the time. But I, I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to present. So. Um, Anybody on the line? Greg, uh, Albert. If not, I'll, I'll... Oh, um, yeah, I don't. I don't have any prepared at the moment. But if uh, if you give me one moment, I could bring up a case. All right. So I'll go through case four while you prepare. Sounds like a plan. Sounds good. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. So case four. All right, 49-year-old female, uh, another young female, um, marathon runner. She presented uh, with difficulties uh, running as, as much as she used to. She was worked up by her PCP, uh, treated her for bronchial pneumonia, still had some dyspnea, 
continue to deteriorate, um, got uh, significantly sick, I guess. Um, then she underwent extensive workups, ex including echocardiogram and CT scans. The CT scans are not available at the time. And then it was found that she had a left atrial myxoma and she was referred for open heart surgery. So all of this workup that was done at an outside facility, um, she was uh, sent to the open heart surgery, right? So um, she went, she underwent open heart surgery at the outside institution and the surgery was aborted because the, the surgeon went in and found a very adhesive cal calcified mass involving the pulmonary veins. So it was really the posterior wall of the atria uh, into the pulmonary veins. So they basically closed, closed up, they closed the heart and, and, and decided to, to send her here for more workup. Um, they did some uh, lymphadenectomy of the mediastinum, which showed um, just some basic hyperplastic changes and sections of the perihelar mass uh, or pulmonary vein mass, I guess, some hypercellular cartilage and mineralization of fragments of bone. So this is a chest x-ray, this is the AP view. And it's really hard to tell much uh, on a PowerPoint if, if you know if we were to to window appropriately, but you can tell there that it seems like the pulmonary uh, veins are a little bit too dense. And when you look at the lateral, the, clearly uh, they're very very dense. Uh, that explains uh, you know the calcification that was described on that path report. And a few slides from the CT, uh, you can see there's some. Uh, somewhat nodular thickening of the atrial wall and the pulmonary vein ostia, uh, but there's definitely that densely calcified mass uh, that goes into the right uh, pulmonary veins. And there you see that there's some soft tissue component as well, not just calcification. And again, the whole left atrium looks funny. It looks like there's involvement throughout. And just an NPR in the coronal plane. Again, some of the same. That densely calcified nodular soft tissue mass involving the left atrium and extending into this, mostly the superior right pulmonary vein. So went back for excision and they, ex they excised the mass and it turned out to be a primary cardiac osteosarcoma, uh, extensive bone component and containing cartilage. Uh, there was no good assessment of the surgical margins uh, uh, because of the tumor, how fragmented it was. So there was concern that there was some residual tissue behind. Um, there's a very in extensive way to classify osteosarcomas, and this was called a, uh, this is not a straightforward one, uh, based on the histologic grade. So this was thought to be an intermediate to high grade, which is not good for the patient. And again, very, very rare tumor with a prevalence of uh, less than whatever that is. Very, very, very rare, 0 0.002% um, to a quarter of a percent. Uh, metastases to the heart are significantly more common than the primary tumors to start with. And primary cardiac osteosarcoma is, again, extremely rare. About maybe just under 10% of all the cardiac sarcomas, we know angiosarcomas being a lot more common than rhabdosarcomas also in the pediatric population. Um, and just a few cases reported worldwide so far of primary cardiac osteosarcoma. You can see the it can happen any time. And females seem to be slightly affected more frequently than males. Uh, for those cases in the literature, most cases are rising in the left atrium, like the one that we saw. And those that are uh, metastatic uh, involve the, the left sided chambers. All right, so we're talking about the, why do we have bone in the heart? Well, there's mesenchymal stem cells in the heart. Uh, remember, some of the valves may have a structure that is composed of some cartilage. So there's definitely mesenchymal heart, uh, cells in the heart, and that's why we can rarely, but we can definitely develop um, these sarcomas. Unclear characteristics, uh, just weird echoes on the echocardiography. But again, the calcification of computer tomography is, uh, should somehow indicate that there's something definitely weird going on. Diagnosis is based on histology. Um, they will show alpha smooth muscle actin, like the non-cardiac osteosarcomas, and there's going to be some chondroid differentiation that can help 
with a differential diagnosis. And of course, you need to do complete surgical resection when, when possible. And there's not great survival time for these patients, unfortunately. All right, Albert, let's do yours and then we can come back if we have time. Let me, yeah. let me share the screen with you. Uh, so you, I may have. Uh, I'm going to make you presenter. Yeah. There you go. <clears throat> Let's see. I can share one window. Here we go. Um, all right. So I, I might have posted this on social media before. So no fair. Um, if you already seen it, um, this is just a congenital heart MRI. Um, I'll just survey through a few of the image series um, that we uh, typically acquire in our uh, protocol. Um, you, know, you can see there's some spinal fusion and then a big heart uh, quickly off the bat. Um, a quick MRA at the beginning. Let's see what um, this is a non-gated MRA. Uh, this particular series. Um, so you can see the aortic root is large. There's uh, a device at the pulmonary position. The RV is uh, a little bit on the bigger side. Um, so you can kind of guess already what the diagnosis is. The aortic root is uh, dilated, um, obviously a congenital heart. Um, so the diagnosis is, of course, uh, before looking at too much else, uh, tetralogy of fallot. And we're looking at um, uh, probably a bioprosthetic uh, uh, valve in this position. Um, so uh, I'll skip past the other stuff. Uh, we typically do our SSFPs um, synase late because we do the 40 flow really early, um, right after the MRA, but I don't want to give away the answer yet. So you can see that pulmonary valve in, in, uh, in position here, um, and this is a little bit of an off-axis, off uh, short-axis stack, but, uh, um, and, and at 3T, you definitely get a lot of Fiesta band artifact, which is part of the reason why um, I like 40 flow so much at 3T. It's SPGR weighted, so it doesn't have as much of this uh, artifact. Anyway, if you are scrolling through this, you may miss that there is a there is a um, a defect in the heart. Um, you could very almost not see it at all. Um, in retrospect, um, you can see there's something a little bit odd about this little line here um, near the tricuspid valve, um, which on a couple cuts you can see are there. But I wouldn't have noticed it without the 40 flow. Here's another view on the four chamber. Maybe you get a hint that there's something here. Maybe it looks like TR, a little eccentric TR or something. I'll do an axial stack here, um, which again, at, at 3T, all of the off resonance um, artifacts are quite bad, um, especially with the spinal hardware. But you get a sense that there's something going on at the tricuspid valve again. Really tough to read at 3T, um, but fortunately, it's not my main sequence. Uh, these are sort of the, the backup. So let's go to the 40 flow. The only thing I really look at in my congenital patients. All right, so here we are. I think immediately you can see what's happening. Um, the crosshairs are right on it. There's something weird right here. Looks like it's coming off of a uh, sinus of Alsalva. And it explains the funny little jet that goes into the uh, through the tricuspid valve. Kind of does a little swirl on that tricuspid valve leaflet. Does a little funny turn. I'm gonna change my color settings a little bit because it's hard to see with too much of this. Drop my color settings a little bit uh, here. There we go. Focus in. Anybody know what this is? It's coming off of the sinus here, and then there's a little hole pinpoint that flows into the RV. A ruptured sinus of Valsalva in your zone? Yeah, possibly, but the sinus of Valsalva isn't particularly large. Yeah, I often, yeah, that, that's the, it's physiologically the same thing. Um, so, uh, but but it, it doesn't look like it's a, 
to dilate or aneurysmal, but it basically is a is, is a fistula between the sinus of valsalva and the RV. Um, it's a little bit too high, of, it's above the valve, so it's not a um, Gerbode defect, um, uh, but they all function effectively the same. They all behave like VSDs. Um, this, you know, I don't, I don't think we have a, um, uh, uh, perpetrator necessarily, but this is about the size of a needle, um, a pinpoint hole. So it's possible that there was just a pinpoint hole that was post-surgical. It's hard to know for sure. Um, but, um, but essentially we just call it a, uh, I, I just call it a VSD. Um, and, um, uh, and then the important thing is of course, how much flow is going through it. Um, we end up with about half a liter a minute coming through this hole. Um, and um, not a whole lot else. Uh, the other things that are relevant, of course, for this case are the um, uh, the pulmonary valve itself, uh, which is here. And um, you can see it's a little bit stenotic. I think the peak gradient that I got was 25 from 40 flow, which is kind of mild to moderate. Um, uh, so not too bad. Um, and the shunt volume was about half a liter a minute. So not, not tremendous. Anyway, um, nice little application of 40 flow. Really nice images. Thanks, Albert. Question. No um, do you, you, you probably have more experience with 40 flow than most people. Um, is that, I, there's very little susceptibility artifact from the valve, from the device. Is that your experience uh, with all devices with uh, when you use the sequence? Yeah, um, so even at 3T, it's not so bad because it's an SPGR weighted sequence um, with a very low um, TE, low echo time. So some of the off resonance issues that you have with Fiesta or SSFP, balanced SSFP, you don't really have. Um, and then the echo time is super short, so um, you don't have too much artifact. You can get velocity measurements inside the valve itself. Um, but what I typically do for peak velocity is I, I tend to scale this up until I see where the red is. And the peak velocity is often just a little bit past the um, the valve, so that's how I tend to do that. Awesome, perfect. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. All right. Uh, anybody else wants to share a case? I see Dr. Limanovich joined us. Hey, Diana. Anybody wants to to share something? Hi. How are you guys? Great. Uh, I actually would like to show a case, but I'm not presenting from PAX, so I will just show a PowerPoint. And uh, the interesting part about this PowerPoint is actually um, not that much the findings as the reason for them. So I'm going to try and share my screen with you guys. Just give me one second. Do you see my screen or not yet? Not yet. Did you accept? I made you presenter. You had to. You were supposed to accept. There was, okay. You got the invite or no? Uh, do you mind sending it again? Yes. Uh, give me one second. Give me one sec. So I'm gonna move from me and make you presenter. There you go. Okay, share. Got it. Share. There you go. Perfect. Okay, do you see it now? Yes. Okay. So this is actually something that um, about two years ago we have uh, published, and uh, as a case in point on Natsuki side. And just last week, we had a similar patient, and that's why I remember that case. So we started with a very conventional imaging, and after Albert, to show this picture, I almost feel ashamed. You know, I'm just showing you some angio, some peripheral angio. But you, you, you do agree with me that we see a feeling defect at the level of the uh, common femoral. Okay, the patient uh, at that point got treatment, went home, uneventful. We saw those images just in retrospect. The patient comes back and the patient still has intermediate claudication and the decision was to proceed with endarterectomy. 
And then endarterectomy was done, and the finding was very peculiar. And as a result of that finding, the patient underwent PET. So what we saw in PET is a couple of things. We saw an avidity within the area of the right atrium. And we also saw avidity not where the femoral artery was, but essentially within the muscle surrounding the hip. Okay, and uh, then we did a CT to look into the heart. Unfortunately, by the time the patient went down to the CT scanner, it wasn't done as a gated CT, it was done as a regular CT of the chest. But nevertheless, you would agree with me that we all can see a relatively large healing defect in the right atrium just at the entrance of the uh, IVC corresponding to the finding that we saw on, on, on PAT CT. And we see a feeling defect in the uh, pulmonary uh, artery, in the segmental pulmonary artery. So uh, the patient underwent echo. The echo essentially showed, it, uh, showed a relatively mobile velous mass that was in the right atrium, but the majority of it is the IVC RA junction, exactly like, like we suspected on CT. And uh, when we uh, did the MRI of the hip, interestingly enough, we saw a, a couple of things. There was a heterogeneous mass in the right posterior medial side that actually corresponded to the finding that we saw on the PET CT. And we also saw a, a, a lack of flow essentially in the, um, in the right femoral vein, an abnormal signal in the AGs and femur. So essentially we are talking about two findings. We're talking finding in the thigh and we're talking about the finding in the heart. And we're trying to connect them both. And this is a pathology report that actually explains it. So uh, this patient was found to have a sarcoma in the uh, uh, femoral um, artery, actually, uh, that presented as a tumor thrombus. Now, what I didn't tell you that uh, this patient, this patient had a history of testicular cancer when he was uh, a young adult and he underwent radiotherapy. So presumably we are talking about a radiation field uh, sarcoma that uh, led us to those peculiar findings that were actually found by chance, okay? And we think it's about radiation-induced uh, soft tissue sarcoma. And this is a small percentage of sarcomas in terms of the latency. It appears uh, to be um, appropriate time range in our patient it was way past 14 years. And uh, unfortunately, after a relatively short course of uh, chemotherapy, um, uh, the patient uh, passed away. Uh, when uh, we submitted this case, we called it straight to the heart because that's essentially what it was. It was a straight to the heart uh, metastatic disease. Questions? All right, very good. Hello? Yes, we're here. Okay, it was silence. So I was wondering if I was talking to myself all this time. No, thank you very much. Um, all right, anybody else's cases? All right, I have one more case in, and I think with that we should complete our hour. So I'm going to make myself the presenter again. So I hope everyone can see the screen. All right, let's see case five. So it's a young male, 30 year old male, no significant, no significant past medical history, presents with headaches, numbness of the, the right side, uh, no focal deficits on exam. Uh, he returned four days, later, four days later without uh, relief of the symptoms. Uh, and they did a CT of the chest, which prompted the MRI. The patient didn't have chest pain or shortness of breath. So let's look at the at the MR. All 
All right, so we have here uh, an axial view, steady state for precession, and you can see right away there's that very heterogeneous, funny looking mass in the right ventricle. Right here. A T1 weighted image, we see that mass has some uh, foci of high signal intensity within it, and some areas that are iso intense to muscle, although slightly heterogeneous uh, within it. Uh, the same T1 with fat sat, we see that uh, pretty much continues to follow uh, that bright signal from um, and some uh, and muscle iso, uh, iso intense signal on parts of it. T2, a ver again, very heterogeneous and high signal intensity and post got some areas that appear to have some enhancement to it and this is the late gut enhancement some areas with some enhancement some areas completely dark with no enhancement within them and a short axis view of the same lesion showing the same in the face sensitive inversion recovery which is your late gut enhancement otherwise the myocardial enhancement looks good Patient went to the OR, so they were able to open the right atrium, see that the right ventricle mass was deep down in the RV, well encapsulated, that's usually good. Um, all of the cords were attached, um, and part of the tricuspid valve as well to the large mass. It was carved out, removing uh, everything, so uh, they were able to kind of leave the papillary muscles and the, the tricuspid valve in place. The size of a golf ball, and resected totality. Um, then they noticed that there was actually damage to the tricuspid valve, so they had to repair that. So this was a mature cystic teratoma of the right ventricle. Uh, again, you can see that there was uh, multiple cysts with respiratory or mucinous epithelium, some cartilage, some salivary gland tissue, so even some brain tissue within it. Um, no malignant cells were identified. So that explains for that very heterogeneous appearance on all uh, MR sequences. Uh, because of that uh, numerous amount of tissue, uh, different tissues that it has within it. So I went and I looked for intraventricular teratomas, and that's where they usually reside in the other ventricles, the one in the head. Uh, so it's hard to find any intraventricular teratomas in, in the heart. It's usually the, the CSF uh, ventricles, and then you, you continue looking, and eventually you'll find the heart picture somewhere in there in Google. Uh, so again, these are very rare. Uh, primary benign germ cell tumor, as we know, uh, should have all three germ uh, layers, uh, endoderm, mesoderm, and uh, neuroectoderm elements within it, more common in the young, uh, in the children and the infants. And it's actually relatively common within the confine of primary cardiac tumors in the newborns and the fetuses. Um, the last majority are in the pericardium or extrinsic to the heart. Uh, they're rarely within the chambers like is in this case. This is a very, very rare presentation for a rare mass. Um, again, usually it uh, arises in the pericardial uh, surfaces and gives you an effusion with tamponade, and that's usually how they present, not like in this, this, this patient. Um, treatment of choice is going to be surgical excision. Uh, when they are intramyocardial, or within, basically within the myocardium, they can be more difficult to excise. Uh, and it's very rare that they can, that they record or become malignant. So again, they're gonna be multilocular, just very heterogeneous mass, both cystic solid components. Uh, they can have any appearance uh, depending on those components on the sequences that we use. Um, and again, when you have calcific densities can be helpful in diagnosis. You know, like, like in the ovaries, when you have a, a tooth in there, it kind of clinches the diagnosis. And from the literature, uh, a couple of cases, again, usually extrinsic or pericardial based. Uh, this is a big mass you see in the chest x-ray as a mass in the AP window. And then it shows that it's uh, mostly cystic uh, on this image and can be confused with a pericardial cyst uh, when there's no solid component that uh, readily available on imaging. And this is another patient. And again, you can see this is a fetal MRI, this is uh, intrauterine, and you can see there's an intrapericardial uh, teratoma. You can see on the image A on the top right, there's that, uh, that effusion associated with it. Um, 
and then there's that mass that's extrinsic to the heart. If you look at the bottom left image B, it's almost the size of the heart right there. All right, and that's that's it for my cases uh, today. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed them. Uh, thank you, um, Albert, Diana, for, for sharing your cases. Guys, any questions, any comments? Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you much. Uh, hope thank to you. See you all next month on our next Curious uh, Case uh, webinar. Uh, you know, pay attention to your emails from NASCI and social media. I uh, hope to see you guys soon. And again, next time, feel free to bring your cases and share with everyone. All right. Take care, guys. Bye.